Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. The Wild West Spanning from the mid-1800s to the early 1900s was a period of American history that has been romanticized in popular culture. Despite its portrayal in movies and games, the reality of the Wild West was often less dramatic, though still not without its dangers. The legendary figures we're told about in stories embodied the spirit of the frontier, facing challenges that tested their resilience and courage and ultimately ending in their deaths in a variety of ways. Bill Pickett, a rodeo star known for his bulldogging skills, the Earp brothers who famously confronted the clanton McLaurie gang at the OK Corral, and Calamity Jane, a tough fighter and nurse who struggled with the burdens of fame. They all met death in different ways, as did the outlaw Black Bart, Wild Bill Hickok, Jesse James, and others. The Old West would have been a harsh place and time, with gunfights, disease, executions, and accidents, all ending in the same way, with the victim six feet under. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… Charles Howard Schmid, Jr. charmed and befriended the teenagers of Tucson, Arizona in the 1960s, all while brutally murdering three young girls. One of the lesser-known cryptids is something called the Hide Behind, a mysterious creature that stalked 19th-century lumberjacks, preying on those who let their guard down in the forest. Brianna Maitland left her dishwashing job and was never seen alive again. Despite various theories and sightings, Brianna's disappearance continues to baffle investigators and haunt her family, who still hold out hope for answers and her safe return. In 1906, explorer Robert Perry claimed to have discovered a mysterious island he named Crockerland, but was it a genuine find, a calculated deception, or something even more bizarre? Lyndia Morell's quiet drive home took a chilling turn when she encountered a mysterious craft and experienced a baffling episode of missing time. Was it a case of alien abduction? In May of 1963, a bizarre creature terrorized Centerville, Illinois, prompting over 50 calls to the police from alarmed residents. Descriptions ranged from a half-man, half-woman to a half-man, half-horse. But first, we step into the Wild West, where no matter how tough and rugged you might be, you can never defeat Old Man Death. And he was creative in how he dispensed his touch. We begin there. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Despite its wild reputation, the Wild West wasn't as crazy as movies and games make it seem. It was actually more peaceful than some big cities today. The wild, action-packed scenes from movies like The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly and games like Red Dead Redemption are exaggerated. 
but that doesn't mean the West was without danger. Outlaws still robbed trains, and sheriffs still chased after cowboy criminals. Even though danger wasn't everywhere, it was intense when it happened. People faced quick-draw gunfights, rattlesnake bites, diseases, and harsh weather making survival tough. Even relationships had their risks. People have different ideas about what counts as the Wild West. Some say it was from 1865 to 1895, while others believe it lasted from the early 1800s until 1916, the year of the last stagecoach robbery. The West can mean anything west of the Mississippi River or just the desert southwest, depending on who you ask. Many settlers traveled through the West on the Oregon Trail. With so many stories from the Wild West or Old West, it's easy to imagine yourself there. Think about dusty trails, thirsty horses, six-shooters, and coyotes as you consider what it might have been like to face the challenges of the Wild West. Most legends of the Old West made their name with one or two daring moments spread out over a lifetime of riding trails and living regular lives. But Bill Pickett faced impossible challenges almost every day. He was a rodeo star and one of the best in the West. It's unclear if Pickett actually invented bulldogging, but he definitely perfected it. In bulldogging, Pickett would leap from the back of a horse onto a wild steer and wrestle it to the ground. Born in the 1870s, Pickett was one of the few Old West legends who lived long enough to be filmed. He starred in two movies, but unfortunately no reliable footage of him wrestling steers has survived. Pickett lived until April 2, 1932, when a horse he was trying to rope kicked him down and trampled him. In 1993, he was honored as part of the Legends of the West series of postage stamps. If you were part of the Earp family, you would have stood alongside your brother Wyatt during one of the most famous showdowns in Wild West history. The Earp brothers controlled the town of Tombstone, and it was only a matter of time before they clashed with the clanton McClory gang, a group of rustlers who lived nearby. The tension exploded on October 26, 1881, at the O.K. Corral. The two groups met in a vacant lot behind the corral, and while it's unclear who fired the first shot, the gunfight was over in just 30 seconds, leaving three men dead. The remaining members of the clanton McLaurie gang fled to the hills, ending the standoff. If you were a member of the Camp Grant Apaches, you would have endured brutal attacks by American forces before trying to live in an uneasy peace with nearby white settlers. But that peace was shattered on April 30, 1871. On that day, a group of white settlers, Mexicans, and Tohono O'odham Native Americans attacked the Camp Grant Apache tribe. They killed as many as 150 Native Americans and captured children to be sold as slaves in Mexico. Their actions were in response to raids in the Tucson area, but the Camp Grant Apaches had nothing to do with those raids. Despite this, the attackers were put on trial and found not guilty, adding to the tragedy. Calamity Jane was a well-known figure in the West, admired for being both a tough fighter and a caring nurse. She was closely associated with Wild Bill Hickok, although he did not share her romantic feelings. After his death, she lived in the town of Deadwood and faced many hardships. People exploited her fame, and she struggled with alcoholism. Just before her death in 1903, the Sioux Valley News wrote about her, saying, When, to put it very plain and ugly, she gets drunk, she tries to terrorize the town in good old frontier style, but that sort of thing has been outgrown with a lot of other things, and so Jane finds herself in the lockup, where she is now, among the plain drunks. In her final years, Calamity Jane worked in a laundry before dying of pneumonia in a hotel room near Deadwood. As she had requested, she was buried next to Wild Bill. While they're common in Western films, quick-draw duels were pretty rare in the actual Wild West. The classic movie scene with two men facing off on a dusty road, counting down, and then drawing from the hip almost never happened. Most gunfights were quick chaotic events where both men were scrambling for cover. 
These duels weren't usually the result of a formal challenge or a sober decision. They often happened because of boredom and alcohol, not honor. Wyatt Earp, one of the most famous lawmen of the West, said it best in his autobiography, saying, "...the most important lesson I learned was the winner usually was the one who took his time." Even if you were a quick-drawing cowboy like Wild Bill Hickok, you weren't safe after a heated card game. Hickok became famous nationwide through articles that exaggerated his dangerous exploits. In his later years, his eyesight started to fail, and after accidentally killing a deputy, he gave up carrying guns. Instead, he turned to gambling. One day, in the town of Deadwood in South Dakota's Black Hills, a man named Jack McCall joined Hickok's poker game. Hickok kept winning, and by the end of the game he had taken almost all of McCall's money. Feeling bad, Hickok gave McCall some money for dinner and sent him off without any hard feelings. But McCall did have hard feelings. The next day, Hickok sat down for another poker game, this time with his back to the door, which he usually avoided. McCall entered the saloon, walked up behind Hickok, and shot him, ending the life of the famous cowboy. Maybe you would have followed in the footsteps of Charles Earl Bowles, one of the most successful outlaws of the Old West. Known as Black Bart, Bowles held up 28 stagecoaches without ever getting caught. He was famous for being a gentleman bandit. He would steal from the strong boxes but never took money from the passengers. Some stories even say he left behind verses of poetry after his heists. When Black Bart was finally caught, he spent four years in San Quentin prison. After his release, when asked if he would go back to his old ways, he said, No, gentlemen, I'm through. After that, Black Bart checked out of his hotel and disappeared into the West, vanishing into legend. We have no idea how he died. Imagine you set out from Independence, Missouri in May 1873 with a wagon full of supplies and your small family following the famous Oregon Trail. When you reached Fort Laramie, you started developing a nasty cough. While diseases like dysentery and diphtheria were common in the West, cholera was the real threat. With little sanitation, cholera spread quickly through contaminated food and water. The first warning sign of cholera was painless but severe diarrhea, followed by dehydration and eventually kidney failure. Wagon trains and settlements dreaded cholera outbreaks, which could wipe out half their people if not controlled. Some doctors knew what caused diseases like cholera, but there were very few doctors in the West. Because of this, the most common way to handle it was quarantine. This meant the sick were left alone to fight the disease, often dying of kidney failure on the dusty trails. If you led your own crew of ruffians, like Jesse James, you would have survived plenty of attempts to bring you down. However, even feared leaders eventually become vulnerable at some point. In 1881, a group of railroad companies organized by Missouri Governor Thomas Crittenden collectively put out a $10,000 bounty for both Jesse James and his brother Frank. This proved too tempting for a man who had grown close to James in recent months, Robert Ford. Ford's brother Charlie was part of the posse, but the prospect of both a reward and a pardon for past misdeeds proved too tempting. Jesse James trusted the Ford brothers and invited them to move into his house in St. Joseph, Missouri. Terrified of James's legendary reflexes, the brothers waited until he took off his coat and set his holster aside. When he did, Robert Ford ended James's life. The Ford brothers were pardoned for the deed and eventually got the money from the railroad companies. It could get pretty lonely out in the West, so it was common for men to seek comfort in saloons along their trail. While many enjoyed nights with, shall we say, escorts, most didn't know much about safe intimacy. Legendary frontiersman Wild Bill Hickok supposedly had urinary troubles and worsening eyesight, both symptoms of STIs like chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. These symptoms bothered Hickok, but the treatments he received were even worse. One so-called cure involved rubbing mercury on his skin, and another involved inserting a heated metal wire into his urethra. Since penicillin hadn't been discovered yet, 
STIs spread easily. While Hickok did not die from an STI, and some even doubt he was infected, many other cowboys weren't as lucky. While Wild Bill and Jesse James met sudden, untimely ends, he could have become a legend like Kit Carson. A true frontiersman, Carson embodied the quiet, disciplined courage that young men of the era admired. Kit Carson was one of the luckiest men of his time. Born in 1809, he narrowly escaped death many times while fighting other trappers, crossing the Mojave Desert, and surviving blizzards in the Rocky Mountains. In 1844, Carson led John C. Fremont on an expedition that ran into trouble with Native Americans. Fremont later wrote, Carson may be considered among the boldest, so full of daring. Two men in a savage desert pursued day and night an unknown body of Indians into the defiles of an unknown mountain, attack them upon sight without counting the numbers, and defeat them in an instant. However, the tough life on the frontier eventually wore him down. In 1868, Carson's health had deteriorated. That same year, his seventh child was born, but complications from the birth took the life of his wife Josefa two weeks later. This loss seemed to break Carson's will to live, and he died one month later when an aneurysm burst in his throat. Maybe you were an everyday troublemaker who got caught after a train robbery went wrong. Now you're in custody, awaiting judgment. In the Wild West, hanging was actually considered one of the more merciful sentences. The idea was that the fall would break the person's neck, leading to an instant and relatively painless death. But it didn't always go as planned. Tom Blackjack Ketchum is a famous example. He ate well in prison and weighed around 200 pounds by the time he faced the gallows. When they finally dropped him, the rope was so tight that it completely severed his head from his body. A doctor had to reattach Ketchum's head before burying him. Coming up, Charles Howard Schmidt Jr. charmed and befriended the teenagers of Tucson, Arizona in the 1960s, all while brutally murdering three young girls. Plus, Lindia Morell's quiet drive home took a chilling turn when she encountered a mysterious craft and experienced a baffling episode of missing time. Was it a case of alien abduction? But first, one of the lesser-known cryptids is something called the hide-behind, a mysterious creature that stalked 19th-century lumberjacks, preying on those who let their guard down in the forest. That story is up next. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or So Bad It's Good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer, all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching and our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. The hide-behind is a terrifying creature from the folklore of 19th-century lumberjacks. These lumberjacks already had plenty to worry about, like physical injuries, bears, and falling trees, but the hide-behind added an extra layer of fear to their lives. According to the stories, the hide-behind got its name from its creepy way of hunting. It would hide behind trees in the forest and stalk its prey. Whenever someone turned their back, it would creep closer and closer. When it got close enough, it would instantly gouge out the victim's stomach and intestines, feasting on the raw meat. These attacks were so sudden that even if the victim survived the initial assault, they often died of fright. 
Describing the hide-behind is tough because it's rarely seen. Those who have caught a glimpse of it say it looks wraith-like and vaguely humanoid. It's incredibly slender, allowing it to hide behind all kinds of trees. It must also have fearsome claws to eviscerate its victims so quickly. So how could one avoid such a dangerous creature? The answer, surprisingly, is drinking alcohol. The monster reportedly hates the smell of alcohol and won't eat anything that reeks of it. Lumberjacks would drink to protect themselves when they thought a hide-behind was nearby. Of course, some might have used this as an excuse to drink more. But where did these tales come from, and why? These stories originated in logging areas like Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Michigan, which were wild places in the 19th century. Being a lumberjack was a tough job with many daily dangers. The hide-behind might have been a story to keep men alert for real threats like bears and other wild animals. Or it could have served as a reminder for lumberjacks to stay vigilant at all times. Another possibility is that the hide-behind was a way to explain mysterious disappearances and deaths of fellow lumberjacks. According to the book Giants, Monsters, and Dragons, an encyclopedia of folklore, legend, and myth, the creatures described as a predatory cannibal beast that lurked around the loggers' camps until one was alone long enough to be grabbed and carried away to be consumed. The hide-behind might have helped logging camps cope with the fear of losing men to accidents, getting lost, or other tragic events. Charles Schmid, born on July 8, 1942, in Tucson, Arizona, had a tumultuous upbringing that set the stage for his troubled future. Given up for adoption by his unwed mother just a day after his birth, Schmid was raised by Charles and Catherine Schmid, who owned and operated a nursing home in the Tucson area. Despite their efforts to provide a stable home, Schmid's childhood was far from idyllic, as he constantly clashed with his adoptive father until his parents ultimately divorced when he was just four years old. As Schmid grew older, he attempted to connect with his birth mother, but she rejected him, telling him never to return. This rejection likely contributed to his feelings of isolation and inadequacy, which he would carry with him throughout his life. During his high school years, Schmid found some success in athletics, particularly in gymnastics. In 1960, he led his school to the state gymnastics championship, winning first place in both the flying rings and still rings competitions placing in the long horse and earning fifth place on the horizontal bar. Schmidt later reflected on his attraction to the sport, stating, "...the thing that kept me fascinated with gymnastics was that it frightened me. If I slipped or fell, that could be the very last time." However, despite his talent, Schmidt quit the team in his senior year and was later suspended for stealing tools from the school's shop class, ultimately leaving high school without a diploma. With no prospects, no job, and no education, Schmidt moved into a small living space on his mother's property, relying on a $300 monthly allowance from her to get by. He spent his days with friends Paul Graff, John Saunders, and Richie Bruns drinking and cruising Speedway Boulevard in search of girls to pick up. Schmidt, who was short and scrawny, went to great lengths to make himself appear more attractive, stuffing his boots with rags and metal cans to seem taller drawing a fake mole on his face, and dyeing his hair black to resemble his idol, Elvis Presley. As Schmid became more confident in his ability to attract women, his behavior took a sinister turn. On May 31, 1964, he decided to act on his long-held desire to know what it felt like to kill someone. With the help of his girlfriend Mary French and friend John Saunders, Schmid lured 15-year-old Aline Rowe into the desert under the pretense of a double date. In a horrific act of violence, Schmid and Saunders raped and murdered Rowe, while French waited in the car listening to the radio. They buried Rowe's body in the desert and kept the crime a secret among their circle of friends. 
Shockingly, Schmidt's actions were an open secret among his high school acquaintances in Tucson. One friend later remarked, a lot of people knew, but it was already too late. Telling would just have made it tough on everyone. A year after Rowe's murder, Schmidt's 17-year-old girlfriend, Gretchen Fritz, and her younger sister, Wendy, vanished. Once again, Schmidt confided in his friend, Richie Bruns, telling him about the murders and even showing him where the bodies were buried. Fearing for his own girlfriend's safety, Bruns fled to his parents' home in Ohio, where he revealed everything he knew about the killings. Schmidt, now dubbed the Pied Piper of Tucson by the media, was arrested and put on trial for the murders of Aline Rowe, Gretchen Fritz, and Wendy Fritz. The case garnered significant attention, with renowned attorney F. Lee Bailey, known for his work on the Boston Strangler case and later the O.J. Simpson trial, brought in as a consultant. In 1966, Schmid was found guilty of murder, receiving a sentence of 50 years to life for Rowe's death and the death penalty for the Fritz sisters' murders. When the Arizona Supreme Court abolished the death penalty, Schmid's sentence was commuted to life in prison. He attempted to escape from prison, but was unsuccessful. On March 20, 1975, Schmid was violently attacked by fellow inmates who stabbed him repeatedly, causing him to lose an eye and a kidney. He succumbed to his injuries ten days later. The story of Charles Schmidt and his victims has inspired some popular culture. Joyce Carol Oates's 1966 short story, Where Are You Going, Where Have You Been?, drew inspiration from the case, as did the 1985 film Smooth Talk, which featured Treat Williams in a role based on Schmidt. In 2014, actress Rose McGowan made her directorial debut with the film Dawn, which portrayed the story of Schmidt's first victim. Aline Rowe, renamed Dawn in the film. In the fall of 1973, a seemingly ordinary night turned into an extraordinary encounter for Lyndia Morell, an event that has intrigued UFO researchers and enthusiasts ever since. This incident not only features a close encounter with an otherworldly vehicle, but also includes an episode of missing time, suggesting a possible alien abduction. The incident's credibility is bolstered by Lyndia's character the context of a wave of similar sightings and a subsequent sighting witnessed by multiple people, including a police officer. This case also involves inexplicable control over the witness and her vehicle, and evidence of telepathic communication. The incident occurred on November 2, 1973. Lyndia Morell had just finished her shift at a sauna in Manchester, New Hampshire. At around 2.45 a.m., she began her journey home. About 10 minutes later, she stopped at Ben Roy's restaurant to meet a friend for coffee. After about 45 minutes of conversation, they parted ways. Lyndia then stopped at a nearby gas station to fill up her car before continuing her drive home just before 4 a.m. As she passed a local supermarket, Lyndia noticed a strange yellow light in the sky to her left. Initially, she thought it might be a planet but when it flashed red, green, and blue lights, she dismissed this idea. She continued driving, keeping the object in view, which appeared to be getting brighter. Lyndia's attention was fixed on the light, which disappeared and reappeared several times. As she approached Moore General Hospital and a nursing home, the light blinked out again, but now she realized she was witnessing something unusual. She slowed her car and kept her eyes on the sky, the light reappeared as she neared the Boston and Maine Railroad crossing, staying in view long enough for her to travel about two miles. As she approached Goffstown, the light vanished once more. Driving through the town, the light reappeared briefly before disappearing again. As she reached the intersection of Route 114 and Route 13, the light was back, much closer and lower than before. It now hovered directly over Route 114, giving Lyndia the unsettling feeling that it was waiting for her. At this point, Lyndia estimated the object was about 1,500 feet away. 
she could see more details, a globe-shaped object with a honeycomb-like exterior glowing orange-gold with red, blue, and green beams of light. The object had an oval window on the upper left side and a translucent quality. As she watched, she heard a high-pitched whine that she could feel in her body. Then things took a terrifying turn. Lindia found herself unable to remove her hand from the steering wheel or take her eyes off the object. She felt as if something had taken control of her body. The next thing she knew, she was on a different part of the road, about a half mile from where she had been, with no memory of driving there. Her car was moving much faster than before, seemingly under the object's control. As her car raced toward the object, Lindia noticed a figure through the oval window of the craft. The figure had a gray face with loose, elephant-like skin, a slit-like mouth, and large, egg-shaped eyes with black pupils. Despite the fear gripping her, she felt a message enter her mind telling her not to be afraid. Lindia continued to panic, fearing she would be captured. The object grew brighter as her car passed a cemetery and neared a house. She managed to free one hand from the wheel, covering her eyes and turning the car toward the house. She stopped the car on the lawn, and with the engine running and headlights glaring, ran toward the house, encountering a growling dog. Moments later, she found herself banging on the door, shouting for help. The door was opened by Mr. Bedouin, the homeowner. Behind him were his wife and family, all awakened by Lindia's frantic knocking. Mrs. Bedouin later described Lindia as terrified, with wide eyes and covering her ears as if from some unbearable sound though the Bedouins heard nothing. Lindia staggered inside, repeatedly stating that she was not drunk or on drugs and that a UFO had tried to pick her up. The Bedouins contacted the Goffstown Police Department, and patrolman Daniel Jubinville arrived around 4.40 a.m. He found Lindia's car with the engine running and headlights on and turned them off before going to the house. Jubinville found Lindia's account strange but believed she was genuinely frightened. After taking her statement, he, along with Lindia and the Bedouins, went outside. They all saw a strange glowing light in the sky, similar to the one Lindia had seen earlier. Jubinville used his flashlight to signal the light, which moved slightly and changed colors in response before disappearing. While it remains uncertain if the light was the same craft Lindia had encountered, the similar details and location suggest it might have been. The incident, despite being strange, remains unexplained but credible. The encounter with Lindy and Morell is considered credible due to her character and the lack of any attempts to gain attention or financial gain from her experience. This incident occurred during a wave of similar sightings across the United States, many of which involved encounters with humanoid figures. One puzzling aspect is the notion that the craft controlled Lindia's car she acknowledged that she might have pressed the accelerator unconsciously, but this doesn't explain her inability to remove her hand from the steering wheel or the missing time she experienced. Lindia suggested that the intelligence on board the craft might have wiped her memory of that part of the journey. This raises the possibility of an abduction or the use of advanced technology to manipulate time and memory. To fully understand the significance of Lindia Morell's experience, it is essential to delve deeper into the various elements of the encounter. The interaction between the object and Lindia's vehicle is particularly intriguing and raises questions about the nature of the control exerted by the craft. Lindia's description of the car being under the control of the craft is one of the most perplexing aspects of the encounter. While it is possible that her foot was pressing the accelerator unconsciously due to the shock and fear, this explanation does not account for the missing time she experienced. The fact that she found herself half a mile down the road with no memory of driving that distance suggests that something more extraordinary was at play. Lindia's feeling that the craft wiped her memory of that part of the journey hints at the possibility of advanced technology capable of manipulating human perception and memory. This idea is not entirely far-fetched within the context of UFO encounters where witnesses often report similar experiences of missing time and memory loss. Another fascinating aspect of the encounter is the telepathic message Lindia received from the figure in the craft. 
The message, which reassured her not to be afraid, is consistent with other reports of telepathic communication and UFO sightings. This phenomenon raises questions about the nature of the entities behind these encounters and their ability to communicate with humans in ways that bypass traditional verbal or physical means. The physical and emotional impact of the encounter on Lindia was profound. The high-pitched whine she heard and felt in her body suggests that the craft emitted some form of energy or frequency that affected her on a physical level. The sheer terror she experienced, evident in her frantic actions and her state when she arrived at the Bedouin's home, underscores the intensity of the encounter. The involvement of the Bedouin family and patrolman Jubinville adds a layer of credibility to the incident. Their observations of Lindia's terrified state and the strange light in the sky corroborate her account, providing additional evidence that something unusual occurred that night. Lindia Morell's encounter took place during a wave of humanoid sightings across the United States in 1973. This period saw numerous reports of UFOs and encounters with humanoid figures, suggesting a broader phenomenon at play. Examining these sightings can provide valuable context for understanding Lindia's experience and its significance. Many of the sightings in 1973 shared common elements such as the appearance of human figures, telepathic communication, and episodes of missing time. These similarities suggest that Lindia's encounter was part of a larger pattern of interactions between humans and unknown entities. The credibility of witnesses during this wave of sightings, including Lindia, was often high. Many witnesses were ordinary people with no history of making extraordinary claims, lending weight to their accounts. The consistency of their reports, despite the lack of contact or coordination between them, further supports the idea that these encounters were genuine. While the encounter remains unexplained, several theories could potentially account for the events described by Lindia Morell. The most straightforward explanation is that Lindia encountered an extraterrestrial craft and its occupants. This theory is supported by the advanced technology and telepathic communication described in her account. The wave of sightings in 1973 suggests that Earth was under observation or visitation by extraterrestrial beings during this period. Some skeptics might argue that psychological and physiological factors could explain the encounter. The stress and fatigue of driving late at night, combined with the power of suggestion and imagination, might have led Lindia to misinterpret ordinary stimuli as extraordinary. However, this explanation does not fully account for the physical effects she experienced or the corroborative testimony of other witnesses. Another possibility is that Lindia encountered advanced military technology being tested in the area. The high-pitched whine, control over her vehicle, and telepathic communication could, theoretically, be the result of secret experiments. However, this theory raises questions about why such technology would be used in a manner that would frighten and potentially endanger civilians. The encounter of Lindia Morell in 1973 remains an unsolved mystery. The combination of a credible witness, corroborative testimony, and the broader context of similar sightings makes this case particularly compelling. Whether these experiences represent extraterrestrial contact, advanced technology, or something else entirely, they challenge our perceptions and push the boundaries of what we consider possible. Lindia Morell's encounter, with its elements of missing time, telepathic communication, and the control of her vehicle, for the moment, still leaves all of us perplexed. Up next, Brianna Maitland left her dishwashing job and was never seen alive again. Despite various theories and sightings, Brianna's disappearance continues to baffle investigators and haunt her family, who still hold out hope for answers and her safe return. And in 1906, explorer Robert Perry claimed to have discovered a mysterious island he named Crockerland. But was it a genuine find? A calculated deception? or something even more bizarre. These stories and more 
when Weird Darkness returns. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. On March 19th, 2004, a young woman named Brianna Maitland was last seen at her dishwashing job at the Black Lantern Inn in Montgomery, Vermont. It was a little before midnight when she left the restaurant to go home. Several of her co-workers asked her to stay and have dinner with them, but she declined. Brianna was tired and eager to get to the home she shared with her childhood friend, Jillian Stout, in nearby Sheldon. She had a second job as a waitress in St. Albans and had to be up early for her shift. With a smile and a wave, she left through the back door and was never seen alive again. Her mother would later report something unusual that happened with Brianna that day. In the morning, she had taken an exam to receive her GED and afterward went out with her mother Kelly for lunch to celebrate. Her father was out of town for work. Kelly later recalled her daughter being in good spirits and talking about her plans to attend college. After lunch, they went shopping, and while they were waiting in the checkout line, Kelly said that something caught Brianna's attention. She told Kelly she needed to leave and would be back shortly. After completing her purchase, she met Brianna in the parking lot and noticed that Brianna seemed shaken and upset. But her daughter didn't want to talk about it. She needed to get home, she said, and get ready for her shift at the Black Lantern Inn that night. Not wanting to pry, Kelly didn't ask any other questions. She dropped Brianna off at home between 3.30 and 4 p.m. This was the last time that Kelly ever saw her daughter. Jillian Stout was surprised when Brianna didn't come home after work that night, but assumed she had gone to her parents' house. It wasn't until three days later, on March 23rd, that she called there to ask about Brianna. That was when everyone finally realized she was missing. A few days earlier, on March 20th, the day after the last sighting of Brianna and two days before anyone knew she had vanished, her pale green 1985 Oldsmobile was discovered abandoned off East Berkshire Road and Route 118, about a mile outside of Montgomery. There was nothing ordinary about the spot where it had been left, though. It was found parked partially inside an abandoned barn at a place known locally as the Old Dutchburn Farm. It appeared that the vehicle had been backed into the barn, damaging it slightly. Investigators later came to believe that this minor accident had been staged. A search of the car revealed two of Brianna's uncashed paychecks on the front seat. They also found her medicine, driver's license, makeup, contact lenses, and what appeared to be all her clothing. Even stranger was that additional items that belonged to her were found strewn on the ground in front of the car along with a woman's fleece jacket that didn't belong to Brianna. It was lying in a field a short distance from the barn. 
After the abandoned car was discovered, the police found Brianna's paychecks inside and assumed she was the owner of the car. She wasn't. The car was registered in Kelly's name. If they had contacted Kelly, it would have been realized that Brianna was missing two days earlier. Instead, the police went to where Brianna worked to inform her about the abandoned vehicle. Needless to say, she wasn't there. Three days later, her disappearance and the discovery of the car were finally connected. After word spread of her disappearance, several witnesses came forward and reported seeing Brianna's car at the old barn. Some had seen it there on the same night she disappeared, including one man who thought he had seen the car's headlights on around 12.30 a.m. He did not see anyone in or around the car. Another man who passed by around this same time recalled seeing a turn signal flashing on the car. A few hours later, around 4 a.m., a former boyfriend of Brianna's drove past the barn after a night of partying over the border in Canada. He recalled thinking that he recognized her car but didn't see Brianna or anyone else around it. Weirder, several motorists passed the car later that morning and found the scene so strange they stopped and took photos of it. One of them noticed some loose change, a water bottle and either a bracelet or necklace on the ground next to the car. As soon as the abandoned car and the disappearance were linked, the police began a search, an investigation, and sent out a call for help. This brought the FBI to the scene to meet with the local authorities about a possible link between Brianna and a nursing student named Maura Murray who had vanished in Haverville, New Hampshire a little over a month before. Haverville is only about 90 miles away. Both of them were attractive young women with brown hair and both vanished after car accidents. Personal items were also found in both cars. The FBI eventually concluded the two cases were not connected and the local investigators were back at square one. The investigation delved into Brianna's life before she disappeared. About three weeks earlier, she was reportedly attacked by a female acquaintance in front of several witnesses. The reason for the attack was unclear, but Brianna did not try to defend herself, even though she had several years of martial arts training in her background. She did go to the hospital, though, where she was treated for cuts on her face, two black eyes, and a concussion. She also filed a criminal complaint against the other woman. At the time of Brianna's disappearance, the case against her attacker was still pending. The police dropped the charges when Brianna wasn't found, against the objections of Brianna's parents. So, what happened to Brianna? Some believe that she left on her own. Apparently, she had mentioned to some friends that she wanted to take a trip somewhere exciting. She had run away before, but even the police had a hard time believing she would leave her car, her identification, and two uncashed paychecks behind. They believed that she was the victim of foul play and that her vanishing could be drug-related. There had long been serious issues with drugs in the area, thanks to the proximity to the Canadian border. Brianna's parents agreed that their daughter came to harm, but didn't believe that she was involved in drugs or that drugs played any part in her disappearance. Her parents have separated after Brianna's vanishing, and her mother now lives in New York. With most of the cases I share here on Weird Darkness, the events that occurred were so far in the past that little hope remains that they might be solved. The story of Brianna Maitland is different. There's still hope that she could be alive. In 2006, a woman that resembled Brianna was caught on security footage at a poker table at the Caesars World Casino in Atlantic City. Could it have been her? We'll never know. The woman was not identified. In 2004, Brianna was only 17 years old. She had brown hair and hazel eyes, was 5 foot 3 inches tall, and weighed around 110 pounds. Her nose was pierced on the left side. She had a faint scar that extended from her left eyebrow to her forehead, and she wore contact lenses, which were left behind in her car. Also left behind was the medicine that she took for severe migraine headaches. If Brianna is still out there somewhere, perhaps there's a chance that she'll be found. She has a family that still misses her, and still has a mystery that needs to be solved. In 1906, veteran explorer Robert Perry returned from an unsuccessful expedition to the Arctic. He had hoped to reach the North Pole, 
but was forced to turn back due to bad weather and dwindling supplies when he was within 175 miles of his target. Undeterred, Perry immediately began planning for his next expedition, but first he needed financial support. Perry's 1906 expedition had been partially funded by American businessman George Crocker, who had donated $50,000. Hoping to secure another significant contribution from Crocker, Perry decided to name a previously undiscovered island after him. Perry claimed to have spotted this island about 130 miles northwest of Cape Thomas Hubbard, one of the northernmost parts of Canada. He briefly mentioned this in his 1907 book, Nearest the Pole, stating that he had seen the faint white summits of a distant land from the summit of Cape Colgate about 2,000 feet above sea level. However, Perry's journals tell a different story. On the same date he claimed to have seen the land, he wrote in his diary, no land visible. Decades later, people still debate whether Perry's Crocker land was an innocent mistake, caused by a mirage, or a deliberate attempt to swindle money from Crocker. From the distance, Perry reported, it would have been impossible to determine if the land was a peninsula or an island unless the sightings were extremely definite. This discrepancy casts doubt on Perry's claim. Unfortunately for Perry, the 1906 San Francisco earthquake devastated Crocker's finances, leaving him unable to support any further explorations. Nevertheless, Perry secured funding from the National Geographic Society, enabling him to attempt another expedition to the North Pole. This time, according to his own account, he succeeded and reached the top of the world on April 6, 1909. Upon his return, Perry discovered that Frederick Cook, a surgeon who had accompanied him on an earlier expedition, claimed to have reached the North Pole a year before Perry. This claim deeply troubled Perry, who sought fame at any cost. His supporters attacked Cook's credibility, and the debate over who reached the Pole first intensified. During this period, the existence of Crockerland became a focal point in the dispute. Cook claimed that during his journey to the North Pole, he had traversed the region where Crockerland was supposed to be, but found no such land. To settle the matter, one of Perry's backers, Donald Baxter McMillan, proposed an expedition to search for Crockerland. If the island could be proven to exist, it would vindicate Perry and discredit Cook. Backed by the American Museum of Natural History, the American Geographical Society, and the University of Illinois' Museum of Natural History, the Crockerland expedition set off from the Brooklyn Navy Yard in July 1913. The team included McMillan, five other experts, and Minnick Wallace and Inuk, who acted as a guide and translator. Just two weeks into the journey, their ship, the Diana, crashed on the rocks along the Labrador coast due to the captain's drunkenness. The expedition transferred to another ship, the Eric, and continued north, finally reaching northwest Greenland in mid-August with the help of the local Inuit. They set up a headquarters and began their preliminary trips to place supply caches along the route. In March 1914, Macmillan, Walter Elmer Ekblah, Fitzhugh Green, and seven Inuit set off on a 1,200-mile journey by sled across the frozen land. After three days of climbing the Beatstadt Glacier, Ekblah suffered severe frostbite and had to return to the headquarters. One by one, the rest of the party also turned back, leaving only Macmillan, Green, and two Inuit, Pugatok and Inakusik, to continue. After ten days of sledding across the treacherous sea ice, Macmillan and Green spotted what they believed was Crockerland on the northwestern horizon. Macmillan excitedly described seeing hills, valleys, snow-capped peaks extending through at least 120 degrees of the horizon. However, when they showed the landmass to Pugatok, he declared it to be a mirage, a hookjok. Despite Pugatok's assertion, the group pressed on for five more days before realizing the Inuit was right. What they saw was an illusion called Fata Morgana, which makes ships appear to float in the air and non-existent land appear suddenly. Macmillan later wrote about his disappointment, describing his shattered dreams and hopes. With Crockerland proven to be a myth, the explorers began their return journey. After crossing the sea ice just in time before it began to break, Macmillan sent Pugatok and Green to explore a route to the west. During a storm, one of their dog teams perished, and the two men began to argue over the direction to take. 
When Pugatok tried to sneak away with the remaining dogs, Green shot and killed him. Ekblaw later described this as one of the darkest and most deplorable tragedies in the annals of Arctic exploration. The remaining members of the expedition attempted to return home, but the harsh Arctic weather delayed their rescue. It took three years and three rescue attempts before they could finally return. During their time trapped in the ice, the team documented the culture of the indigenous peoples and studied the region's natural habitat. They brought back thousands of photographs and hundreds of artifacts, now displayed in the University of Illinois' Spurlock Museum and the Perry Macmillan Arctic Museum at Bowdoin College. Interestingly, exactly one century before Macmillan's expedition, in 1818, Scottish explorer John Ross turned back from his search for the Northwest Passage upon seeing an enormous mountain, which he named Croker's Mountains. Like Crockerland, it too turned out to be a mirage. Up next on Weird Darkness, in May of 1963, a bizarre creature terrorized Centerville, Illinois, prompting over 50 calls to the police from alarmed residents. Descriptions ranged from a half-man, half-woman to a half-man, half-horse. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. On May 18, 1963, a strange creature reared its ugly head in Centerville, Illinois, and just across the Mississippi in St. Louis. The police were bombarded that day with more than 50 calls from residents who had seen some sort of monster. The first sightings of the monster had taken place a few days earlier in St. Louis, when several children reported a half-man, half-woman with a half-bald head and a half-head of hair. He was seen lurking around the Ninth Street housing project, and often disappeared into an old tunnel around 12th Street. The sightings were taken seriously by the police. Patrolman Bill Conroe of the St. Louis Police Department noted, "...those kids were sincere. They saw something." He added that the creature, whatever it was, had allegedly scuffled with a man near the Patrick Henry School. On May 18th, the sightings began in Centerville, located across the river and near the towns of East St. Louis and Cahokia. James McKitty, a local man who went on record, stated that the creature that appeared in front of his house was half man and half horse. Some believe that this meant McKinney saw a mythological centaur, but I don't think that's what he meant. I think he just meant that it was large and hairy. If a half man, half horse creature had been lurking in town, more people would have reported it that way. But whatever it was remains a mystery. 
McKinney, like the dozens of others in Centerville, called the police about the monster, but they were never able to track it down. The sightings continued for a few more days, but whatever this boogie man might have been, it seems it was gone for good. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Isaiah 40, verse 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the Creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and His understanding no one can fathom. And a final thought, don't base your view of God on someone who may have misrepresented him. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. <laughs>